Hi, everybody. Welcome. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, and uh, I'd like to say first, I'm Isa Helfgott. I'm the Vice Provost for Global Engagement here at the University of Wyoming. Uh, that means I have the pleasure of supervising all of the international operations um, of the University of Wyoming. It also means if anybody has questions about today's events, opportunities for faculty, staff, um, the Wyoming business community, and you don't have a chance to make those connections, which I hope you will, but if you don't, please reach out to me. Um, I have a, some members of my team here also. Assistant Director Sean Bunning is over here in the corner and we'd be very happy to help follow up any of those connections. I'd like to just say thank you to everybody for coming today. It's really nice to see such a diverse group of business and academic leaders with us. I have the task, happily, of introducing our first speaker, a great champion of both global and business connections, University of Wyoming President Ed Seidel. Under his leadership, the university is working very intentionally to collaborate with the Wyoming business community on economic development opportunities, to promote a culture of and an infrastructure for innovation and entrepreneurship in Wyoming. This is exciting for our business leaders, creates new opportunities for our uh, faculty and our students, and as we're talking about today, provides important new pathways for mutually beneficial collaboration. President Seidel. Thank you, Isa. And um, well, first I just want to say, uh, we've just had a delightful uh, meeting to open uh, our relationship, and I particularly want to thank you all for that. And I want to especially acknowledge um, Consul General Mikami, um, Dep Deputy Counsel uh, Azeshi, Chief Executive Director Hayashi, Director Ito, and Manager Ramsey, and of course all of our UW faculty, staff, and guests. And I'm looking forward to a very, very good dialogue and with some follow-ups to come. It is my honor to welcome you to the inaugural 2023 Japan-Wyoming Business Forum. We greatly value the collaboration and the support of both the Consulate of Japan and JETRO, the Japan External Trade Organization, in bringing this forum together. I'm hopeful that we can take stock of the current economic ties between Wyoming and Japan and really discuss ways to strengthen them in mutually beneficial ways. I've personally been to Japan quite a few times, both for academic and economic development purposes, and I know how important such work really is. As the flagship and the land-grant University of Wyoming, and in fact, the only university in Wyoming, so we're a one-stop shop for you all. <laughs> um, we are deeply invested in the economic development of the state of Wyoming and also in collaboration with partners. We're also equally committed to preparing our students not merely to enter the global economy, but to help shape it as well for the benefit of all. Japan is Wyoming's fifth largest export partner, accounting for over $63 million worth of Wyoming goods and services in 2019. In the same year, Wyomingites imported over $14 million in Japanese goods and services. This demonstrates that we already have a very strong and symbiotic relationship that I know can only grow from here. There are many leaders and experts in this room today that I know are looking forward to fruitful conversations and how we can strengthen our relationships. And I look forward to hearing them, to being part of them, and as we talked earlier, helping to ensure that we have actions taken to follow up on them. So I wanna thank you all for being here today, and I look forward to seeing how this collaboration develops as a result of the conversations that we have today. Arigato gozaimasu, and thank you very much. Thank you, President Seidel. And next, I'd like to please invite Consul, Consul General Mikami um, to come and give some welcoming remarks. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Mikami. I'm Consul General of Japan. I came today from Denver. Dr. Edward Seidel, Dr. Isadora Helfgott, Mr. Sean Banning, uh, Ms. Yuki Ayukawa, and others from the University of Wyoming, and also Mr. Yotetsu Hayashi, Ms. Misako Ito, Jetro San Francisco, Mr. Isama Azechi, my deputy, 
who is a real promoter for this event in our office. Uh, great panelists, distinct guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It is my great joy to be here participating in the first ever Japan Wyoming Business Forum. I'm very excited and looking forward to learning today from the wonderful lineup of speakers and panelists. I hope today's forum will be a great step to further promote the relations between Wyoming and Japan into the future. I just had the honor to have a luncheon meeting in Cheyenne with the Honorable Mark Gordon, Governor of Wyoming. He was also very excited when we talked about this seminar happening at the University of Wyoming in Laramie today. Japan's relationship with the United States is quite remarkable. I strongly hope today's seminar will further strengthen the relations between Japan, Wyoming, and the United States. Thank you very much. Thank you. And next, please, I'd like to welcome Chief Executive Director Hayashi from Jetro San Francisco office. Thank you, Isaiah. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Yotetsu Hayashi uh, from Jetro San Francisco. It's a great honor to be here. And I would, I would like to say great thanks to uh, President, uh, uh, Mr. President of this uh, university, also uh, the team of the University of uh, Wyoming. Thank you very much. Uh, today, I want to introduce uh, the uh, Jetro. Uh, I, don't, I don't think uh, you are familiar with the, the Jetro, so I would like to show you some uh, slides here uh, to introduce the Jetro. Okay. Uh, what is Jetro? Uh, Jetro is a, a non profit organization uh, established by the uh, Japanese government. Uh, we promote the uh, investment, also export from Japan to foreign countries, also vice versa. So uh, we establish uh, the uh, uh, more than 100 uh, offices in, uh, in the, within the Japan, also all, all over the world. And in the United States, we have six uh, offices in the United States, and we station in San Francisco. And uh, uh, actually, uh, Japanese government and, uh, and the government of the United States, we have already signed the uh, uh, partnership agreement to uh, uh, have a cooperation for the uh, investment, also the uh, trade issues. And uh, uh, actually, uh, we uh, invite uh, uh, some uh, states uh, from the United States to go to Japan uh, for their uh, promotion in Japan. Uh, to have a good conversa conversation in Japanese uh, with the Japanese industries. And uh, we also provide the uh, uh, digital platform uh, to uh, let the, the uh, uh, state governors uh, to have a uh, uh, chance opportun opportunities of uh, presentation through the uh, internet. Uh, uh, this is a uh, 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 kind of cases uh, that uh, uh, from the Wyoming, uh, uh, he made a presentation, presentation through the internet. Then also, uh, we invite uh, uh, several uh, state governors to be in Japan uh, to have a, a conversation for the investment or trade uh, promotion uh, in the Japanese uh, seminars. Uh, we have a good uh, uh, connection, uh, uh, conversations with uh, the Japanese major industries. So maybe uh, you have a chance to go to Japan uh, through our support. So uh, today uh, I had a, a good chance with uh, uh, have a good chance uh, to meet with uh, gov your governor, uh, Mr. Gordon, and uh, we had a, uh, we had a good talk uh, conversation, and that uh, saying that uh, you have a good great opportunities uh, in in Japanese market. I believe that uh, you have a, you are the, the, the uh, biggest uh, largest producer for the coal, also the second largest for the natural gas, and the energy 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 issue is the most important issue for the Japanese industry. Uh, we heavily rely on the uh, coal mining uh, from the, the Russian market, but actually we cannot uh, uh, import from uh, Russia. Instead, we are more rely on the uh, uh, Australian, Australian uh, coal these days. So maybe in the future uh, we have we can 
uh, have a, a great opportunities to uh, develop this uh, coal mining uh, industry uh, the business uh, with you in the future. Although, uh, in uh, some other points like uh, tourism, uh, this is my uh, first time to be here in the Wyoming. Uh, I see a great view of a landscape here. Also, uh, uh, I believe that we can uh, enjoy a lot of uh, fishing or some other kind of uh, leisure here. So maybe for the Japanese tourists, it's a quite uh, very, very uh, attractive uh, tourism, uh, tour tourism industry and market here. So maybe we can share this kind of opportunities uh, in the future. So uh, I think uh, uh, this, today, this is a great chance to have a good conversation with you. I hope I can enjoy this meeting today and uh, uh, can have a good, great opportunity in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now I would like to invite, please, Ms. Yuki Ayukawa to come up. Um, uh, for those of you who don't know, we have the great pleasure of hosting Yuki here for these two years. Um, and it is thanks to her connections and initiative and presence at the University of Wyoming campus that this event has uh, been possible today. So I'd like to say thank you to Yuki and bring her up to um, conduct the rest of the program. Thanks. Thank you, Ise. I'm Yuki Ayukawa. I'm based at a Global Engagement Office here as a uh, part of Japan Outreach Initiative Program, known by its acronym, the JOI Program, J-O-I Program. Um, so the JOI coordinator will assign the region of the United States where have uh, more limited access to Japan or Japanese culture. And I'm so honored that I'm the first joy coordinator ever in Wyoming. <laughs> and I'm hosting a workshop and an activity to promote learning about Japan across Wyoming and I hope to build a more uh, strong and friendly relationship between Wyoming and Japan. And it's very thankful that Council General uh, uh, bring, me, uh, bring, to me, uh, bring to my attention this forum opportunity. So um, I was so thrilled to take up the task of organize this first business forum between Japan and Wyoming. And so thank you very much to Japanese Generate and Jetro and my very cooperative colleagues from UW's uh, Global Engagement Office. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. So now I'd like to introduce our main presenter today, Ms. Misako Ito from Jetro. She is a director of business development and public relations at Jetro, the Japan external trade organization in San Francisco. She joined Jetro in 1999 as a researcher focusing on U.S. economic and trade issues. Since 2017, she served as a deputy director of the Americas in Best Japan Department, where she utilizes her knowledge on the U.S. economy and the business environment to assist U.S. companies in initiating uh, investment presence in Japan or in developing business in the Japanese market. As a director at Jetro San Francisco, she dedicates her efforts to supporting a U.S. startup in their business effort in Japan, as well as working with Japanese corporations to accelerate their open innovation efforts. She holds an MA in public administration from the Felt Institute of Government of the University of Pennsylvania. So please, Ms. Ms. Itao. Hello. Okay. Um, hello, my name is Misako Ito. I'm a director of Jetro San Francisco, and thank you, Yuki, for a kind introduction. Um, it is a great pleasure to speak at this important event, and I'd like to express my sincere appreciation to the University of Wyoming to uh, host and facilitate this event. This is my first time to come to Lullamy, but I was in Cheyenne last summer for a family trip, 
and happy to be back to Wyoming in this short period. So my role today is to introduce JETRO to you and to talk about the current economic relationship between Japan, the U.S., and Wyoming and give an idea for further economic connections. Please don't hesitate to stop me if you have any questions or we can talk during the networking sessions after this event. And please allow me, it might be a little bit redundant, but um, I want to go thoroughly because it, it's the first time to ex um, introduce our organization to this Wyoming audience. So, um, a brief introduction about JETRO, the Japan External Trade Organization. So we are a nonprofit organization governed under Ministry of Economy, Trade, and Industry in Japan called METI and headquartered in Tokyo. We have 76 overseas offices worldwide and off one office in each prefecture throughout Japan. Within those, as Mr. Hayashi mentioned, we have six offices located in the US and one in Canada. Each covers their jurisdictions and our San Francisco office works closely with the West Coast and Mountain States. So, as a government organization, JETRO's main role is to support Japanese companies doing businesses around the globe. Our San Francisco office leads this program to support Japanese startups who try to start their businesses in the U.S. market. We work together with accelerators in the U.S., such as UC Berkeley, Skydeck, 500 Startups, Techstars, and Plug and Play, and so on to do a boot, type camp, boot camp type of acceleration programs. Also, Japan has a rich history of craftsmanship and culture, not to mention traditional but innovative food products. JETRO works closely with these manufacturers throughout Japan to connect with the markets who appreciate these products. We used to and still support exhibiting at the events, but during the pandemic, we launched EC malls in order to promote Japanese products online, anytime, anywhere. Oops, sorry. What is unique within our activities is that we have the Invest Japan program, which supports innovative U.S. companies who want to expand their business to Japan and work together with Japanese companies. We've started this Invest Japan program back in 2003 with nearly 20 years of work, more than 2,000 foreign companies have successfully started their businesses in Japan with JETRO's support. We believe new ideas and innovation from overseas will bring diversity and dynamic impact to Japanese society and business field, as we are facing, as you know, a lots of challenges as aging society and lack of workforces and in need of collaboration with overseas technologies. Also, in, the, in regard of collaboration, we enjoy working together with state and local governments in the U.S. Oftentimes, Japanese have very limited information with the local or the with entire U.S. Uh, information. And but you know, the U.S. this country represents diverse businesses and opportunities. So we educate and encourage Japanese companies to invest not just to California or to New York, but we introduce to more business-friendly states in order to bring mutual successes. So this, um, I've talked enough about JETRO, so I'd like to start from a bird eye view of the US-Japan economic relationships. Maybe you, some of my, you know, you might know, but just kind of a brief introduction. So Japan ranks fourth as the trading partner to the U.S. after Canada, Mexico, and China. This chart shows a U.S.-Japan trade statistics by products for 2021. U.S. exports to Japan mostly consists of agricultural products, chemicals, oils, and machinery, and majority of imports from Japan are machinery and transportation equipments. U.S. and Japan have a trade agreement, the U.S.-Japan Trade Agreement, USJTA, which went, to in, which, which went into effect in January 2020. And many products exported to Japan from the U.S. will either be duty-free or receive preferential tariff access. 
Also, Japan is the leading country for the FDI in the U.S. for more than 10 years. Since 1990, Japanese direct investment in the U.S. economy has grown steadily. Total investment at the end of 2021 was $721 billion, ranking first among all investor countries ahead of Germany, Canada, and U.K. At the end of 2021, Japan's direct investment increased more than three times more than 2009, 2009, the year of the financial crisis in the United States. This chart is to show how well Japan is contributing to the U.S. economy. As you can see, the total number of Americans employed by Japanese-owned manufacturing companies in the U.S. was more than 500,000 in 2020, a record level a record level among all investor countries. It has increased by 84.6% oh, since 2010, while the total number of employees in the overall U.S. manufacturing sector only showed an increase of 5% during the same period. Also, Japanese companies are very R&D focused and are constantly pursuing innovation, innovative new products and processes to maintain a high degree of global competitiveness. In the United States, Japan's direct investment in the U.S. R&D sector reached a record level of $12 billion in 2020. The current level of R&D investment by Japanese companies indicates that they are engaging in the U.S. Innovative, innovation process. We don't just invest in lands or financial assets, but our investment makes U.S. jobs, brings R&D functions, pay taxes, and more. So from now on, moving on to Wyoming and Japan relationship. When it comes to Wyoming-Japan economic relationship, it has a slightly different landscape. Smaller chart on the right-hand side shows that Japan ranks 11. It depends on the um, statistics that you see, but this statistics that I took from the ITA show that we are ranking 11th as an export partner for Wyoming, way behind even compared to the other Asian countries. And a pie chart showing the breakdown of Wyoming's exports by product to Japan. When you add up, to, when you add up the two top products, basic chemicals and non-metallic minerals, 90% are primarily engaged in manufacturing of chemically defined compounds, heavily dominated by energy sector. So this is a map um, showing foreign investment in each state. I mentioned in the previous slide that we ranked the first in the investment foreign investment in total. And this shows the statewide uh, investment numbers. U.S.-based Japanese companies ranked the first in total numbers of firms in 36 states. Japanese companies are huge foreign investors in the U.S., as well as a growing employer, especially in manufacturing center, uh, sector, as I mentioned previously. However, as you can see in the Wyoming, Wyoming is one of the three states where Japanese, Japanese investments ranks the third. I know it's pretty a good significant number, but we would like to increase or get at a higher position. Since Wyoming and Japan have a great potentials in economic cooperation. So in order to introduce the future potentials, I chose two areas that could be our next opportunities, opportunities which are green energy and Web3. So the green sector is an area that is filled with opportunities for innovation and collaboration. Japan declared in 2020 that it aims to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. This could only be achieved not only with the government, but also with the private sector in Japan and the other world. And we are pushing forward with innovation in this sector. With this in mind, then Prime Minister Suga formulated Green Growth Strategy in 2021. The strategy specifies 14 promising fields that are expect expected to grow and provides them with action plans from the viewpoints of both industrial and energy policies. Japan upholds an 
ambitious goal while showing realistic pathways towards it, and the strategy directs all available policies to supporting positive efforts by companies toward this goal. Prime Minister Kishida succeeded this strategy and declared last year to invest U.S. dollars in one trillion U.S. dollars toward carbon neutral in 10 years. With the government support and the improvement of business environment, clean tech sector in Japan is extremely, extremely vibrant now. Japanese clean tech climate tech startups are categorized in this chart. Some are, some are university spun outs, some receive a global awards, some are already working with overseas gas companies. Jetro is consolidating these company information and can make introductions to the companies if you are interested. And this um, landscape map is available for downloading from the LinkedIn uh, link on the bottom of this slide. One of the important and most active areas within the green growth strategy is hydrogen. Both the US and Japan set an ambitious target for reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 and a common goal to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. Japan Hydrogen Forum, JH2F, was established to form, by, form collaborations between Japanese companies, US companies, and federal, state, and local governments. This is a members only forum. All members are Japanese companies located in the US and have technologies and businesses in the hydrogen field. Jetro is the founder and is the secretariat office of the forum. Four other government related organizations listed over there are supporters of this event, uh, this forum. The number of member companies are increasing we have currently 24 companies. I noticed there's only 23 logos here. I can't remember one more, but I'll, I can look up afterwards. They are all eager to work together with US companies and federal, state, and local governments. Toyota Motor North America and Toyota Tsusho already started their demonstration projects with partnering US companies at the port of Los Angeles related to hydrogen and seeing success so far. Other, members, other member companies have also launched or considering to launch their project, not just at the port of Los Angeles, but in Utah, North Dakota, and other areas around the globe regarding hydrogen production, transportation, port, and other areas. Other than hydrogen, here are two green energy projects related to Wyoming. Most of you know Japan Coal Frontier Organization, JCO, and Kawasaki Heavy Industries, and the state of Wyoming signed a, an MOU on May 2020 to conduct a demonstration test of carbon dioxide separation and capture technology using solid absorbance at the Integrated Test Center, ITC, adjacent to the Dry Fork Power Station in Wyoming. Also on your right-hand side, Itochu Corporation, one of the leading trading houses in Japan, announced investment in Raven SR in 2021. Raven is a startup headquartered in Wyoming, seeking to produce renewable hydrogen and renewable fuels from municipal solid waste. Raven will start to produce new renewable hydrogen for mobility from municipal solid waste in California first, and then expand the businesses to produce renewable diesel and other resources that can reduce greenhouse gas emissions in aviation and land transportation. Japanese companies are eager to work with local companies and startups, so hope to see more projects happen in Wyoming. Another area for future collaboration is in Web3. Web3 and related technologies gained a lot of public attention this past year in Japan, similar to worldwide trends. Japan experienced a disaster related to crypto in 2014 to 2015, and the fever toward all crypto-related technologies went quiet. However, when the FTX meltdown came up last year, we found out that Japan received almost no impact 
and stay solvent while other countries failed. It was because the Financial Services Agency, FSA, in Japan has carefully prepared regulatory environment for emergency situations as they learn lessons from past incidents. Lawmakers are also being active in embracing the potential of Web3. Liberal Democratic Party's Web3 project team published a white paper last year and is intensely updating to realize them. The white paper includes policy recommendations on themes such as promoting NFT businesses and protecting the rights of content IP holders. It is no surprise that Japan can positively adopt the concept of Web3, as Japan has rich, high-quality intellectual property, such as animation and games, that are internationally competitive. It has great potential to lead the world in the Web3 economy. Prime Minister Kishida is strongly supporting this movement. I put a NFT a token from Prime Minister Kishida. This has been awarded to the um, students who had finished the curriculum of the Liberal, um, Liberal Democratic Party's uh, seminar. We hope to have close communication with the state of Wyoming, who stands as a leader in DAO legislations. So this landscape chart of the Web3 industry is produced by a Japanese venture capital in 2022. It is fairly a new industry, so it might not have captured the entire picture of the industry, but you can see the trend in Japan. The number of new Web3 projects by Japanese founders is increasing rapidly, despite the strict regulations governing cryptocurrencies. As mentioned in the previous slide, Japanese lawmakers are working ty tirelessly to fix a high barrier to allow entrepreneurs to enter into this market. The, the bar chart shows the interest in cash is heading toward energy, environment, and Web3, topics that are touched today. With sufficient support from policy and financial perspectives, these areas will see a great development in coming years. So, so we've been enjoying our strong ties with the state of Wyoming and Japan in the energy, coal, and other sectors, but we'd love to have more vibrant economic connections with innovative ideas. We're happy to work, Jetro is happy to work for both ends, and so please feel free to reach out to us. We have this um, three people, three people team with the CD um, chief executive director, Hayashi. So this QR code also leads to our um, website. Please don't hesitate to reach out to us anytime, and we'll, I'm looking forward to speaking to you after this event. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Um, I'm wondering, since um, we've wrapped up the presentation part a little earlier than I'd anticipated, would you be open to taking some questions now, if there are any from the audience? Yes, President Seidel. People out, out there can't hear me. Oh, Penelope, I see you there. Okay, great. I'll come to you next. Um, 
So uh, we and we're looking at, to grow that uh, footprint around uh, uh, cryptocurrencies and blockchains, uh, smart contracts, working with particular energy sectors, and even focusing initially on the energy uh, sector. Uh, that might be an interesting uh, place to start. And we have, as you know, a very strong energy uh, industry here. With uh, one of the, the great things about Wyoming is it's small enough that we can um, we can contact anybody within um, a half an hour. <laughs> it's just, it's just really, it's very easy for us to, to make introductions and help uh, develop those things. And of course, around entrepreneurship, I just want to highlight, uh, we have Penelope Shihab here, who is the director of our uh, program for um, uh, uh, the Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation and our College of Business just won a national award for the best entrepreneurship program uh, for, uh, for students. Uh, and so now we have a a program to develop entrepreneurship hubs across the entire state as well as academic programs to educate students on entrepreneurship and I think there's a great opportunity there um, with one idea being can we support each other as we grow uh, some of our companies in our own backyards and they would like to have access to markets say in, from our side to Japan or from the Japanese side into Wyoming where we can also provide a sort of a gateway to other regions around the area. So uh, those are a few things that really struck me. I'm sure other uh, of you will have many other ideas as well, but I just I wanted to highlight that I, I was excited by the things I heard there. I see Penelope has her hand up. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Sean. Uh, it's just I want to stand up here to show you that we're also diverse, so we have different people in Wyoming. <laughs> So um, this is very, uh, very, very um, important when we work with internationals because I was scared before coming here. But then when you come here and when you start uh, mingling with people and um, looking at the opportunities and the young people in the university, you will be surprised of uh, the potential. So uh, that's why I, I, I just wanted to talk. But also uh, through my center, Center for Entrepreneurship and, and Innovation, uh, we're very open to host um, speakers, uh, startups, um, mentors, uh, any kind of collaboration and innovation. So we want our students to be exposed to different kind of like mindset and uh, uh, ideas and, and different cultures in, in the ecosystem for the Japanese or uh, through your companies. I don't know. We need to sit down maybe tonight through the dinner and just to brainstorm how can we get our students with um, with the list of the companies and, and the activities you guys are doing. So, thank you. Are there other, oh, yes, Ms. Ito. Um, to briefly answer to both of your questions and comments, um, we do have a spin-off mission program re um, related to Select USA in June, and this year it's happening in May. Um, last year, we brought Japanese companies to the state of Montana introduced to, in order to introduce their business um, environment and make Japanese companies think about the potential and their next, ex next field of expansion for the, um, in the United States. So we do this uh, spin-off mission annually. So there's one way to introduce Wyoming a vibrant economic system and connect to the entrepreneurship that um, we can start talking with the governor's office or a, a Wyoming Business Council about bringing Japanese companies to um, the Wyoming. And also, I think as um, General uh, Consul General previously mentioned that this is the kickoff, I guess. Um, we Japanese have very limited information about the state of Wyoming, and we're so happy that we can have this opportunity. So increasing the exposure to Japanese community is important, and also um, vice versa. So I'm glad that this forum happened. Thank you. Yes, Dan. Dr. Dan McCoy. Uh, thanks, President Seidel, for, for mentioning uh, uh, about the WORTH initiative. So the director of the Wyoming Outdoor Recreation, Tourism, and Hospitality Initiative here at the university. And I'll just say maybe just a few words about tourism in Wyoming. It's the, lar it's the second largest industry in the state generating $4.2 billion last year. And it's the largest private employment sector with over 30,000 people uh, employed. 
Uh, lots of wonderful, amazing natural resources in the state. The first national park, uh, Yellowstone, the first national monuments, um, the first national forest. Uh, over half of the land in, Wy in Wyoming is uh, public land, so lots of opportunities for uh, recreation. Um, I know that you, are, it sounds like there's been some conversations uh, with the Wyoming Office of Tourism, and we work very closely with the Wyoming Office of Tourism uh, to, I know that they work specifically on uh, working with uh, tourism providers who are looking to uh, make connections. Um, in Teton County, uh, which is where uh, Yellowstone National Park and Grand Teton National Park um, is the wealthiest county in the entire country uh, of in the entire U.S. So uh, in terms of, uh, it's a great place to target tourism marketing for visitation to Japan because as we know tourism is an incredible um, export it's kind of a kind of a strange thing because as people visit the country it's considered to be an export rather than an import uh, however it's a, it's that's would be a wonderful place to target market because many people there uh, would really enjoy the skiing in northern uh, Japan I, myself personally would love to go there uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, and maybe jump in the hot springs uh, with with the monkeys and, and, and everything so that would be pretty incredible uh, but anyway I just wanted to say that I look forward to the conversations and just wanted to give you kind of a, a quick um, walk through Wyoming and the wonderful opportunities there are here for tourism and outdoor recreation so thank you I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions before we take a short break and then convene uh, back in here for a panel. Um, are there any other questions or comments at this point? Um, what Dan was saying that um, it, it is a, an unsurpassable experience, I think, to spend an afternoon in an onsen with uh, Nihon no Saru. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, all right. Well. We will be convening right back here for just um, in just about 10 or 12 minutes. If you'd like to take a brief break to take the hike next door to our beverage selection, <laughs> um, there is ice water, there is coffee, and there should be also hot water for tea. Um, the restrooms, if you're not familiar with this floor of the Union, are just around the corner here. There's also some over here next to the main stairs. So um, if you want to take a, a quick 10-minute break or so and then come back in here, we have joining us um, uh, three people in person and one on Zoom. And I need to make sure that that Zoom connection is up and running for him to join us. So uh, hence the need for our break. But um, thank you all for coming. And we'll see you in just a few short minutes. Now, why do people come to Wyoming? The most obvious one is Yellowstone, Yellowstone National Park. So Yellowstone National Park uh, yesterday was 151 anniversary. And they were the first national park of this country. And everybody, including people in Japan, know Yellowstone. So that is a great attraction for people to come here. And of course, Grand Teton is right next to that. And it is the beautiful plate part of this state. And on top of this, uh, the ski resort, Jackson Hall, everyone knows about this as well. It is the second most popular ski resort around the world, next to Zermatt. And then after that is Banff. So that is definitely a, a selling point for this state. And one thing that I would like to make sure to mention, because I was supporting the Denver Sister City as well, Heart Mountain Camp. This is not to be forgotten. It is the you know, Japanese-American internment camp. There are a lot of people from Denver did go visit the ceremony last year as well. So if you are thinking about traveling and bringing students and sending students, this is going to be a good story to tell. Now, I wanted to share the differences and similarities of activities in Wyoming versus Japan. Familiar is the list of things that people in Japan would do when they go to vacation or weekends. We have access to that. You know, Japanese people have access to that. What's different is new experiences, ranching, farming, stargazing. Those are unique experiences. And I'd like to share a little bit of my story. 
when I first came to Denver, I was told the road between Denver to Wyoming is just boring, just take a nap. I started looking around. Cornfield goes all the way to horizon. If I see something move, those are cows and all drilling equipment. I have never seen it. It was exciting to me. I could not take a nap. I'm like, there's another cow. There's another cow. So just to think about different perspective people in Japan might enjoy. That's something, you know, something that might, you may not think about it, but I enjoyed it as a Japanese when I first came here. So how do we bring them here? That is the important part, right? That you have all the beautiful property and national park to offer. The key is traveling duration. It's not just Japan to the United States. Anyone people who traveling right now are looking for direct flight. If they have one stop, maybe. If you go down to second and third stop, people stop and think, do I really want to go? So I think direct flight in the shortest way to get here is a key to that. And accessibility, it's, it's it, accessibility, not necessarily the disability accessibility, but from the airport to the final destination, there has got to be an easy way to get there. I, as an advisor, always make an arrangement from the hotel, uh, airport to the hotel private shuttle is waiting for them. So they don't have to think about how to get there. And group tour availability, and I put the language in parentheses. This is really important for travelers coming from a country whose native language or the primary language is not English. It's intimidating to go to a country that does not speak their own language. That's why Japanese people like group tour, because those are familiar. People who speak Japanese language is sitting in the group a guide speaks their language. It is easy to get around and feel safe to be around. So the package tour, that's why it is popular. Um, familiarity and the inspiration, we talked about that. But those are the things that you, we want to consider when you want to bring people from different country and with a different cultural background to come here. So um, let's talk a little bit of outbound to Japan. 2019, 1.7 million Americans went to Japan, and 2.22, same scenario, borders were not open. So it was a fewer people went there. But the percentage, when you look at it, it was 5.0% of everyone who went to Japan. Now, the last year was 8.7. That is because the, the uh, Asian countries were not open. Uh, people in China, particularly Chinese, are not traveling to Japan right now. That's where the proportion is different, but I think that is going to change once all the borders open. And travelers ages 20 to 44, length of stay 4 to 13 days. If you have ever been to Japan, you don't want to go to Japan for four days. You want to be there at least 9 to 10 days is my recommendation, but you want to stay even longer than that. And the younger generations are interested in pop culture, anime, and combined with the cultural and history activities. So what are the opportunities? Students learning travel. I consider traveling is a dynamic form of education. Once you're in a different culture, you learn a lot more things in a different way. And that is why I believe that TS, the learning experience for students and research travel, as we have talked about earlier with the other speakers, and I think we're going to hear more about that as well. And uh, custom design and leisure ranching ex ex activities and package will be a great draw to this state. So I think that's all I have. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Kay. All right. Um, so this first portion, we're just uh, we're introducing each of the panelists and uh, and ha hearing from them, and then we'll have Q and A with everyone at the end. So I'm sure you all have some questions, but we'll hold on to those for just a moment until we get to the latter part of the the panel. Um, next, um, I think we can switch screens if you don't mind and pull up Jason. I think we'll we'll go on over to Jason Beggar. And Jason is the managing director of the Wyoming Integrated Test Center um, in Gillette and the owner of Armature Advocacy. He was raised on a family ranch in eastern Montana. And after graduating from college, he moved to Washington, DC, 
working for U.S. Senator Conrad Burns, Republican mm -hmm. from Montana, and U.S. Representative Denny Rayberg, um, also from Montana. In Washington, he staffed the House Agriculture Committee and later the Energy and Water Appropriations Subcommittee, focusing on Bureau of Reclamation Water Projects and Department of Energy Office of Fossil Energy Funding. In 2006, Jason accepted a position with the Petroleum Association of Wyoming before becoming the manager of government affairs for Rio Tinto Energy America, which was spun off in 2009 to become Cloud Peak Energy. From 2015 to 2020, he was the executive director of the Wyoming Infrastructure Authority and has led the Wyoming Integrated Test Center since its formation in 2015. In 2020, Jason founded Armature Advocacy, a public affairs and project development firm focusing on energy and natural resource development. Jason has a BA in history from Montana State University, Billings, and a Master of Business Administration from the University of Denver. Jason, his wife Kristen, and two young daughters live just outside of Cheyenne, Wyoming. So Jason, I'll turn the, the mic proverbially over to you. All right, well, I hope uh, everyone can hear me okay. Yes, thanks. Okay, <laughs> good. Well, thanks uh, for giving me the opportunity to join today. I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person, had a, uh, a legislative hearing later, I guess early this afternoon, and uh, there's just uh, the swan song of uh, the Wyoming session this week. So trying to cover as most base, many bases as we can. So um, what I would like to talk to a little bit today is, is my experiences with working with um, both the government of Japan and a couple of Japanese companies with regards to the Wyoming Integrated Test Center. And kind of a quick overview, that facility was designed and developed about a decade ago to look at carbon emissions from coal-fired power plants and having a suitable testing location for those technologies to successfully manage those carbon emissions. Um, fairly early on in that uh, project's development, then Governor Mead had opened a dialogue with uh, the government of Japan and specifically an organization called J. Cole, which um, I guess probably the best way to describe that organization is a, a state chartered or sanctioned organization looking at um, how Japan utilizes coal to provide electricity as well as importing coal, um, the power utilities, you know, kind of a fully um, integrated kind of supply chain regarding coal and, and electricity. And what was really interesting is Japan remains and still is fully committed to coal. You may remember um, 2011, 2012, you know, with Fukushima, um, just politically, nuclear was not no longer on the option, or no, no longer an option on the table. Um, and they, uh, yeah, as from a landmass perspective and kind of where they're located uh, so far north, um, renewables don't have the ability for real high penetration. Um, and then as well, you know, also seismic activity that they have within the nation as well limits some of the things that they can do. And so as a government, they made a choice that we're going to invest in finding the best and, and uh, cleanest technologies to operate our coal fleet as long as we can. And so that was a very much a uh, shared goal with the state of Wyoming. And so an MOU was signed. And, and one of the goals that MOU uses was to try to identify a technology that can be brought to Wyoming to test. And uh, the technology that ultimately, or the company that ultimately came forward with a uh, technology, and, and hopefully we'll see them on the ground in about two months, is uh, Kawasaki Heavy Industries. So, you know, a lot of that discussion started uh, probably 2017, and here we are six years later, just finally to the point where we're going to see some iron on the ground. And so... Um, you know, my observations kind of culturally working with Japan, and I've had the opportunity to travel there a number of times, as well as host a number of delegations here in Wyoming, is it just takes a lot of time. Whereas in Americans, you know, we 
we kind of get down to brass tacks and then, uh, you know, go to work right away. As long as we're kind of on the same page, we skip with the formalities and get to business. For them, it's you know, that building of trust and understanding and kind of knowing one another is really important before they feel comfortable enough to take the next step into entering into a business arrangement. And this might take months and it might take two or three meetings before you finally reach that point where they're ready to take a, um, a, a, a step of developing that relationship. Um, another difference, and, and I guess an important thing to remember is culture and respect is extremely important as, as uh, uh, to, to the Japanese. And so things like, uh, you know, seating arrangements in a meeting, speaking order, uh, giving gifts, those types of things are critically important and could inadvertently offend um, someone that you you don't mean to if you're just not done in the right way. Um, and even and, and the higher ranking officials that you deal with, those sort of shows of, are signs of respect or even more important. Um, you know, I, another aspect is risk tolerance. Um, you know, in the United States, I, I think culturally, we were probably a lot more, um, we have a much higher risk tolerance than a lot of other uh, countries and cultures. And I would say with Japan, it's probably the exact opposite, where uh, they have very little risk tolerance and, and uh, they, they operate more, much more on a, uh, a collaborative um, decision-making process and not as much as with an individual. So um, I remember being in meetings with Kawasaki and we would have about 15 government or, or excuse me, company officials uh, from uh, the Japanese side, whereas there'd be like two of us from Wyoming. And so um, just watching how they interact, uh, clearly there's always a leader in the group or, or a couple leaders. Uh, there's a lot of deference to the senior advisors, um, but uh, they, they, they do tend to make decisions as a group and, and very collaboratively. And, you know, this process can be seen as extremely slow for Americans who tend to be impatient and we like to, to make things happen right away. But um, one thing that I can say is, is once you understand where they're coming from and the, the things that are important for them, for them it could be an extremely um, uh, fun process to be a part of. And I've enjoyed uh, getting to know that aspect of, of the culture and, and uh, dinners and foods. I've had so much great food all the times that I've been in Japan. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of resources out there for business professionals trying to do business in other countries. And if uh, uh, anyone in, in the audience is ever looking to, to take a trip to Japan or host a group in Wyoming, I would strongly suggest um, looking at some of those resources and understanding some of the basic sort of cultural norms because um, they, they are very important. Um, just with that, um, happy to stand by and answer any questions. All right, thank you very much. Oh. And we will be getting to questions shortly, but um, next I would like to invite um, Anya Richmond from the Wyoming Energy Authority um, to share. Anya Richmond has been working in economic development in Wyoming since 2007, working for both small and large communities, and has secured over $33 million in grant funding for projects ranging from community enhancement to large business attraction. At the Wyoming Energy Authority, she is the program director and has been leading the hydrogen initiative. Additionally, she serves as the program director for the Western Interstate Hydrogen Hub, WISH, a four-state collaboration between Colorado, New Mexico, Utah, and Wyoming, which was created to secure federal funding to develop a hydrogen economy in this region. And so with that, I'll invite Anya to share um, 
opportunities she sees and experiences she may have had working in partnerships as well. All right, thank you. Can you hear me? Well enough? Okay, good. So thank you, I'm Anya Richmond and I work at the Wyoming Energy Authority. The Energy Authority, as far as I know, is still the newest agency in the state of Wyoming. We're uh, two and a half years old um, and really created because um, the energy economy is what drives the Wyoming economy. Um, we are small but mighty. My colleague, uh, Marcio Pez Barreto, is joining me. And so with the two of us in this room, you have 40% of the energy authority represented here. <laughs> um, the goal of the, or the purpose of the energy authority is to, to create the strategy and support industry, uh, energy industry for the state. And um, our strategy is simple. It's empowering the nation with a net zero energy economy, or for uh, a net zero energy mix. Um, just a little perspective, because I think the, the audience is a little more diverse than I was um, originally anticipating. So the energy industry in Wyoming is about the same as that of Norway. So it's substantial. Our population, as most of you know, is under 600,000 people. So that means that the energy that's produced in this state is the vast majority of it is exported. And so that's really what we're looking to continue to do is how do we continue to have um, energy be relevant and be a driver and a leader in energy? Um, and recently, as I think everyone should know, the world of energy is changing, right? So um, you, if you weren't paying attention to the news, then at least you're seeing it when you're paying your bills. Um, so the, the prices are changing, the demand is changing. So we know that energy is always going to be in demand, but what that mix looks like, how it's uh, derived, made, transported, that's changing and we don't know exactly what that's gonna look like, but we have to be forward looking and forward thinking. Um, really, as we're looking for these opportunities for continuing to export our energy, we need to be thinking about, we're not just providing energy, we're providing, we're being an energy solution provider. So the demand is for low carbon energy, and so how can we how can we be addressing the whole picture, right? So the end consumer wants to have that energy product, but they want it in a low carbon fashion. How do we supply that net zero energy um, for the nation and the world? Um, but to get to the, the main topic, um, how does Wyoming cooperate and collaborate with Japan? I think there's lots of opportunity and I think that's why we're coming, or one of the reasons why we're coming together today. One of the obvious challenges that we have to look at is Wyoming and Japan are pretty far apart, right? So my quick Google search this morning, there's a distance of 9,260 kilometers between Tokyo and Cheyenne. And for those of us who don't speak metric, that's about 5,750 miles. Um, but we've already been working on exporting energy for a long time, right? So fortunately, even as the energy mix is changing, we can still be leveraging a lot of that uh, infrastructure, all of that know-how for how do we continue to get energy from point A to point B. Um, so one of the obvious things is liquid, natu uh, liquid natural gas, LNG. Um, that's something that's been done for a long time. We've been exporting that. Um, and especially now with the uh, war in Ukraine and the, the pinch in the energy um, supply, there's that very short-term, very real need of how do we address today's energy needs, and that's an opportunity for Wyoming. But as we're looking at that, we also have to be looking at how do we make sure that the fixes we put in place don't um, work against the long-term goals for decarbonization, right? So as we're putting in fixes today to meet that short-term demand, how can we make sure that we're not offsetting or, or um, going backwards for those goals for the next 5, 10, 20 years as we're working towards decarbonization. Um, but the LNG network and infrastructure that we have can still be leveraged going forward for the next generation of energy. Um, for starters, Wyoming is very responsible when uh, producing natural gas. So we have very low emissions, so we're very good at controlling the, um, the methane emissions. emissions. 
And, and so we're very proud of that, and we continue to work towards producing uh, natural gas responsibly. But the other opportunity is hydrogen. Um, and as Sean mentioned, I've been working very heavily in hydrogen for the last year or so. Um, hydrogen can be produced locally through renewable energy as well as from natural gas. So both of those things Wyoming has in abundance. The hard part, as I talked about earlier, is the distance between the two, uh, the two places. How do we get that pesky little molecule from here to there? Um, we can convert that to ammonia. So before I started working at the Energy Authority, I had no idea that ammonia was more than just that smelly cleaning thing <laughs> that you have under your sink. But um, ammonia is a way that you can package hydrogen more tightly. So basically you take nitrogen and pack some um, hydrogen molecule or atoms to it and you get a nicely packed um, molecule that's easier to transport. We've been working with um, ammonia for over a century. It's been largely used for manufacturing fertilizer, but the benefit is that we have knowledge, we have um, infrastructure equipment that know how to, uh, or can that process this and transport it, store it very safely. So this is a great opportunity. We can also be uh, leveraging the natural gas uh, infrastructure. Um, some of that can be converted to, to supporting and transporting ammonia probably going longer than I'd anticipated. Um, the other part, of course, is an economic exchange goes both ways, right? So yay, Wyoming can continue to expand our markets and expand energy exports, but there's also lots of opportunity then to benefit from the partnership with Japan. Um, so some examples then are um, equipment manufacturers, right? So for, for um, turbines, um, for ones that can use the blended... Um, natural gas and hydrogen, or you can be working with ammonia. I think there's excellent opportunity there. Um, I know Jason talked a little bit already about some of the work that's being done. Um, leaders like Kawasaki and Mitsubishi are certainly um, making, great uh, making great strides in that direction. Um, and then also, how do we continue to manage that carbon, right? So there's lots of opportunity there as well. So I think um, Wyoming, we can really be partnering with, um, with Japan on how do we continue to develop, advance, um, and help to deploy and commercialize all of this new technology. Um, Wyoming, we have a culture that supports energy development. Um, we have the natural resources that we can work with sustainably and responsibly. And we have lots of workforce and know-how that um, you know, people understand energy and are willing to embrace it and continue to work with it. So I think those are some excellent opportunities that we can continue to elaborate and explore. Thank you. And now our, uh, we'll turn the, the mic to uh, Ron Goldberg, who joins us from the Wyoming Business Council. Ron is the Strategic Partnerships Director at the WBC. And Ron, um, Ron's extensive communications, coalition building, and project execution experience support the agency's leading role in diversifying and growing Wyoming's economy by leveraging public-public, public-private, and B2B partnerships. Goldberg joined the Business Council in March 2014 as Communications Director, then served as Business Development Director for two and a half years before becoming Strategic Partnerships Director in December of 2019. He previously worked at daily newspapers for 25 years, and so I think it's safe to say that um, he may be the most informed person about Wyoming in this, <laughs> in this room, certainly more than I. Um, so, Ron, we look forward to hearing what you might share with us about how you get these kinds of connections going and, and uh, really whatever you'd like to talk about, but um, how we build our partnerships uh, beyond Wyoming for the benefit of Wyoming. There, there we go. That's what partnership and collaboration gets you. Thank you, Anya. Uh, Thank you, Consul General, in your office and the JETRO team from San Francisco. I enjoyed our uh, meeting earlier today, and I look forward to discussing more. We did talk a lot about energy earlier, and um, I think there's an opportunity here, which is very important, but an opportunity to kind of talk about the other areas we are looking at, and so excited to meet 
and get to know each other and continue our discussions. Um, with the Business Council is the State Economic Development Agency for the state of Wyoming. Um, our mission is uh, create good jobs for Wyomingites, uh, break down barriers to growth, and um, to, um, sorry, be my glasses, uh, and the capacity building. And we talk about capacity building um, at the local level and at the business level. And some of it is kind of teach a person to fish. You know, if we work with local communities, we can help them grow their economic development capacity, how to leverage funding, how to grow revenue, and invest in their communities for economic development. Um, and then with the business side, um, I wanted to introduce or my teammate walk out. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Good timing. Kaylee Holyfield, she will be back. Um, she joined us in the last year, and we created a new position, business retention and expansion manager. And I'm really excited about that because we are focusing on existing businesses in Wyoming, which when I get to my point, you'll, it'll understand where we're going with um, working with Japan and exporting. Um, we have been very focused on energy and what's below ground and above ground in Wyoming. And what we've really tried to focus on the last four years is how do we add value to things like agriculture and have businesses move beyond the commodity to taking stuff grown and made in Wyoming and creating value-added food and beverage products. Craft distilling has done pretty well it's growing in Wyoming, and there is a, a slow, growing, steady market outside the country for our distillers, and how do we create more value-added food products? So when we talk about business retention and expansion, that is a key, key component of growing in that area of Wyoming. Energy, we're really good at, and Anya uh, has talked about that, but how do we do uh, technology, software development, um, value-added food, those manufacturing. Uh, and I think there are manufacturing opportunities also, as Anya and Marcio would say, with what's happening and coming in Wyoming to grow our manufacturing sector with the value-added opportunities with the new energy resources and things like that. So I think the business retention expanager, expansion manager position is very important as part of a collaborative team. There are people in this room I work with all the time. We have Amy Lee with the Wyoming SBA office director. Um, Penelope, you've met her earlier. Um, innovation entrepreneurship, connecting the dots. Um, and Jill with the Wyoming Small Business Development Center Network. Jim Drever with the SBDC. Manufacturing Works, I think, is here. So I'm probably missing people I could go on and on. But the, the point is, I have so much fun meeting with people in Wyoming and outside of Wyoming, and I get to help facilitate the connections and understand what each and every, every one of them is working on and how I can help and who, who should become part of that tribe, shall we say. So the Business Council, we, um, in terms of also with capacity building, we have really worked this last year to tie some action items to that capacity building. Um, the, the academy, where we are gonna have, um, with the Leadership Wyoming, we're now working with them. They have done a great job. You're going through Leadership Wyoming this year, Penn? Yeah. <laughs> so they're, they're bringing the Leadership Wyoming concept to economic development leadership. So there'll be cohort uh, annually of local economic developers, uh, public officials, mayors, um, business people, what have you, to go through a course to, for professional development on economic development and um, tie in some of these themes uh, and make awareness of opportunities for international exporting and, and trade, foreign direct investment opportunities. Um, and then th th there's opportunities that way. But 
it also will help inform we've, we've launched a six week series. Uh, I think we're about to wrap it up, working with many of our partners in this room for export readiness webinars. And I think last I heard, I've been busy with the other things with the legislature, but I think we had about 20 participants. And to give you a perspective, pre-COVID, pre-2018, when we really started looking at trying to identify and prepare Wyoming businesses that were interested, small businesses, with their products being exported, uh, we were lucky to get two or three at a training. And so through the, the, uh, the awareness, the understanding, um, uh, the agricultural side with beef and lamb, people are interested in at least talking about exporting now and is it for me and what I need to do to uh, make more of what I make and become better, you know, working with maybe Manufacturing Works or SBDC, how do I get better at building my capacity to export and to fulfill orders. So we have been churning on that. We got going pretty well in 2019, then COVID happened, and then 2021 toward the end, and then last year we really started ramping up again. I think in 2023 we're gonna see significant uh, strides in that area. So uh, a lot of, t I could talk all day, a lot of capacity building, leadership, collaboration, connecting with partners and having dialogue and understanding markets and opportunities and bringing that back to our Wyoming businesses is the way forward. So thank you. Thank you, Ron. Um, and thank you to each of our four panelists. Um, and now we'd like to open the floor for any questions you might have, um, questions or comments. Yes. Yeah. I'll bring you your mic. It's just I want uh, I want Ron to talk about um, a very new story um, with the Business Council in partnership with the University of Wyoming. Plenty. Uh, I I would love just to um, to talk about that success for us. You talk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad you brought that up when we talk about value added. Um, and technology and agriculture. Um, you know, Wyoming now is on the cusp or cutting edge or verge of a, a global leader in indoor farming, uh, working with Plenty. It was a, a homegrown uh, business that, yeah, spurred out of the uh, graduate student at University of Wyoming and uh, built the indoor vertical farming. But it, it is not... Um, we can't say this enough to people. It is not greenhouses. It is not what you would think. It is uh, technology with software development, with climate control, watering, um, temperature, all everything that tracks the indoor vertical farming. It is um, research and development, which is going to be a key component of their expansion here in Laramie to, I think, 80 jobs or so to more than 200 good paying jobs, opportunities for our students um, who graduate and move on, and uh, plenty of opportunities. So you have technology um, and, uh, um, and then also uh, manufacturing. So this is a solution that, you know, this is kind of a fail safe, people need to eat. And there are food deserts and there are opportunities for this company to, to make an impact from Wyoming globally. So we're very excited. We're, we're at the, the nascent side of this, but uh, plenty of opportunities for R&D and business and UW and, and all these partnerships to work together on this. So. Anything you want to add there, Penn? I think we can. <laughs> It's, it's just um, encouragement and enforcement for the innovation entrepreneurship ecosystem in Wyoming. Uh, just to get this uh, company uh, back to Wyoming, um, 
it's it's for us a big push and inspiration for our students and entrepreneurs uh, to see that we can do big things. This company started very small from an idea for a grad student, and recently uh, Walmart uh, invested in uh, plenty. I, I remember four hundred thousand dollars, and then they are increasing their investment, so it's it's growing big. And they are now um, exploring the opportunities to export out of the U.S. I was in uh, conversation with uh, with with Nate and uh, UW Fox and you guys uh, to uh, uh, to have a collaboration with Cardiff University in the U.K. and have some collaboration. So when we see these kind of uh, companies back to our state because they are native Wyoming and growing and expanding internationally. This is a big, big, big deal for us. That's why I wanted this specific story to be, yeah. uh, to be uh, here now. Thank you. Thank you, Penny. Yes, Isa. Um, thanks, thanks for all of your comments, um, everybody today. I'm uh, Jason and Anya, you talked about some of the physical distance and the cultural distance between Wyoming and Japan. And I wonder if any of this panel or any of our previous speakers want to um, reflect a little bit about what you think we need to do to close some of the distances or to create opportunities or interest on both sides. Um, our colleagues from Japan earlier talked a little bit about the visibility problem. People in the world don't know about Wyoming, and with tourism as our number two sector, economic sector, I think this is a big challenge for us. And so one question that we might engage with each other is about uh, how do we increase interest on both sides for this kind of collaboration? Thanks. Consul General Mikami. Thank you very much you know, for the very good uh, question. I'm a fly fisherman. <laughs> this is a dream place. And I know many Japanese fishermen who know this place. But they don't come because they don't speak English. And she explained that it's very difficult for them. Actually, this uh, Saturday, I think I will go to the Denver airport because they will resume the direct flight. Uh, three uh, times a week, and then towards the end of this month or next month, they, uh, every day they will be direct flight. It's one of the hurdles that she was talking about. They will come to Denver, but from Denver to Wyoming, you know, Casper, Cody, Laramie, or where. This is another thing that we have to connect. Uh, and Okay, I'm a fly fisherman, so I know Yellowstone and the Big Horn River and those, but other people, I'm quite sure 98% of the Japanese people who are literate have ever heard of Yellowstone National Park. And they know in the pictures and they can emerge. But how to come to Yellowstone is another question. And uh, so as she explained, the Ito company lady explained that it, it, it's very important for them, possible, get over the hurdle of language. Okay. Because my father, you know, who passed away recently, didn't speak English. My mother doesn't speak English. And my English is not very good either. <laughs> so, also, I'm a diplomat. <laughs> you know? So it, it's one thing. So maybe in a package or it's one thing. Another thing to make them know, be aware of Wyoming, and make them to be aware of how to come to Wyoming, is, I think. And actually, maybe I will talk with you later. Uh, there is a Japanese you know, sort of organization called the JNTO, Japan National Tourism Organization. They have a chapter branch in Los Angeles. That their job is to promote, you know, tourism. So maybe I will give you the information. And uh, I was talking with this. And maybe you can invite it, them to. They all talk with them, and uh, maybe invite them to your faculty as a lecturer. <laughs> and uh, everybody, okay, all those government also want to come to Wyoming as we did. Thank you very much, <laughs> So uh, you know, this, this is a step, I think. You know, because they might have ideas and again, but there are some hurdles. First is, you know, some people don't know. Another thing is language. 
And even though they speak English and they know how to come, how come? You know, first they have to fly Denver, but from Denver to Cody or Casper, you know, they have to fly in the small planes. And if it's packaged, our whole plane will be full, I think, maybe. So they, these things have to be, you know, get them over in a concrete way, I think. That, that, that's my thinking. Also, I'm a specialist there. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Consul General Mikami. I think um, uh, if you ever decide you're ready to move on to a second career, I'm sure that we could offer you a package as a fly fisherman and a Wyoming promoter. <laughs> Let's see. Did I hit something? Okay, there we go. Yes. That's actually not a question, but a comment. I really would like to take this opportunity to say thank you for having the programs like Yuki came. I've been working with her for a year, and she has been tremendous, going to my kids' school, going around Wyoming, learning and singing and dancing. And, you know, we have a volunteer program that we teach free languages. She has been amazing. We had, like, 50, 60 people sign up for Japan. Finally, she said, Delnoza, I just cannot do that alone. <laughs> you know, um, I think it would be great to increase exchange change programs, um, do from both sides. It would be a really great opportunity to learn about Wyoming, send Wyoming folks. Could it be students and faculty? No. Business owners, sending them for a week or two, like partnership programs, you know, and also bringing back a lot of people like Yuki. Thank you so much. The same idea actually occurred to me, too. I was thinking, um, um, especially in Japanese culture, business really begins with relationship. Um, as Jason was telling us about his experiences working with uh, Kawasaki Heavy Industries, and if you've got more to share on how you go about building those relationships um, and, uh, and what they mean uh, for the future opportunities that devolve from them, um, we'd love to hear that. But I was thinking um, uh, relationship is at the heart of partnership in uh, in any culture, but especially in Japanese culture, I think. And you really need to invest on the front end, getting to know people and building that relationship and building that trust. But once you've, once you've uh, earned that trust or obtained it, uh, in my experience, having uh, my little experience living and teaching in Japan for three years, um, once you have that trust, then you have a partnership that is um, for the long term. Um, and so uh, if you do want to embark down that path of, of building a business partnership or business connection, uh, you're not looking at a short-term business plan for that relationship. You're looking in the long term, and that's measured more on the, the, the order of decades rather than just years. So, um, uh, Jason, would, would you like to comment a little bit more about your experience in relationship building with your partners in the ITC? Sure. Um, you know, I, you, you actually pitched it really well. I mean, kind of the fundamental to anything is, are those relationships. And it is interesting kind of culturally, you know, sometimes I think as Americans, we don't think enough about sort of the interpersonal relationships and the psychology of what it takes to get something done. And, uh, um, you know, the, the, the more you trust, the more you understand um, not only the person, the individual, their personality, but what's important to them, their values, um, what's important to their company, how they value things. Um, you're just going to be that much further along. Um, one of the more interesting things that I had learned, and I didn't learn it right away in, in doing work um, in, in Japan, was that in the United States, when somebody responds to you with yes, we take that as an affirmative. They are agreeing to what I have said. Whereas in, in, if we say in my meetings with, um, say, Kawasaki, when you would say something and they say yes, it was meant to be more, I am understanding what you are saying. It wasn't I was agreeing to this, but I'm understanding what you're saying. And so there are those nuances across cultures that um, if you don't fully understand and appreciate that, uh, you can run into difficulties. Thank you. Yes, Kay. I, so um, I did serve as a vice chair of Denver Sister City, and, and I'd like to share some of the things that we do. Um, one of the important work that Sister Cities do is this high school kids exchange program. And 
we can talk about the, appro the proximity of distance, but the, the people to people relationship gets closer. When you are able to visit family and host family and stay with them, the Japan now becomes a part of their home and culture than it's a foreign country. So um, as an example, our mayor, um, Hancock, he was one of the students who went to Japan. After that trip, Japan became a part of his community. And having that community, even though Japan and Denver are not that close, you know, distance-wise, he felt all close. So I think those kind of things, when you start early to create a development and relationship, it may be able to overcome the physical relationship to feel like, I can go to Denver, from Denver, one more trip. That could be a possibility. That I see a lot of students in high school in Denver are feeling like, Japan is my second home, so I'm going to go there anytime I want to. So that, that's one thing that we might be able to offer. Can I give up a little bit of that? Yes. So I think that there's a student exchange uh, goes to university. So last year I facilitated a, a summer intern from Harvard Kennedy School with the College of Business in here at UW. So it was uh, um, Kioski, it was his name, fantastic student. He stayed in Laramie for several months wrote several papers, they analyzed the Wyoming economy compared to the Japanese economy. And that, that bond, I think, is there. And, and, and add a lot of value and a lot of good data to how do we look the similar between manufacturing in Japan and manufacturing in the in, in United States and Wyoming, and also the decarbonization paths and challenges. So I think the students' exchange is fantastic. Specifically for the UW, I think that is something that should be explored. I see we're getting very close to our time. Um, we might be able to entertain perhaps one more question. Well, it's five o'clock now, but there will be time for individual questions in the reception. Um, one last observation I think I would make is that um, maybe in the relationship building sphere, we could consider also for promoting uh, an awareness of Wyoming, something akin to Leadership Wyoming, but um, bringing partners from elsewhere to get to know us, so Liaisonship Wyoming or something, I don't know. <laughs> Just a, an idea to throw out there. Um, uh, all right. Well. Um, I think, well, I'll invite my boss, Vice Provost for Global Engagement, uh, Isa Helfgott, back to, um, to give us a few closing words before we move next door for uh, a little more time of uh, networking, uh, socializing, getting to know one another, relationship building, and Japanese food eating. So. <laughs> Thanks, John. Um, I don't have, I won't keep you very much longer. Yes to student exchange. Um, absolutely, we're very keen to, we have a few students in Japan right now and very keen to uh, facilitate that in both directions. Thank you for that comment. Um, Again, I'd just like to offer the services of my office for anybody here who needs any assistant, create, uh, assistance creating additional connections with any of the people here or relevant people in your community. We're very much available to you, Sean and I, and for another year and a half, Yuki. Um, so thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you very much to our speakers here and online um, and those who have traveled. And please join us next door for more conversation. That's where the real fun happens. Thanks again.